Good evening. I'm Eduardo Peñalver, the president of Seattle University. Welcome to this latest installment of Seattle University's Institute for Public Services conversation series. I've heard Seattle University described as Seattle's living room, a place where the Seattle community can come to learn about, to think about, and to discuss its most pressing issues in an engaged academic environment that welcomes informed conversation and reasoned disagreement. For over seven years, the Institute for Public Service Conversations has brought governors, mayors, attorneys general, police chiefs, former cabinet members to Seattle University to engage with our students, staff, faculty, alumni, and with the wider Seattle community around vital topics that matter to this community. Ably led by Larry Hubble, past director of the Institute of Public Service, and Joni Balter, professional in residence at Seattle University. These conversations give our students and faculty an opportunity to hear from civic and thought leaders and to pose questions to them at the end of the discussion. Although COVID has forced us to temporarily move these conversations online, we look forward to reconvening in person when public health circumstances allow. In the meantime, though, we are so grateful to Town Hall Seattle for providing us with this online forum, which has allowed us to continue these important and timely conversations. Tonight's conversation is about homelessness. After all the time and effort, why is it getting worse? Homelessness is arguably the, the most salient issue in the current race to become Seattle's next mayor, as the recent mayoral debate illustrated. But while urgent and important, the issue is hardly a new one. Homelessness has been a persistent challenge throughout this metropolitan region for some time. In fact, in 2015, the former mayor, Ed Murray, declared a state of emergency regarding homelessness. And the problem has only continued to grow since then. I think one reason that homelessness is such a potent issue is that it intersects with so many of the other issues that roil our dynamic, rapidly changing region, including economic growth, housing affordability, economic inequality, mental health, racial justice, public space, and public safety. And at Seattle University, a Catholic university committed to human dignity, economic justice, and the common good, homelessness engages with our most cherished values in complex and sometimes contradictory ways. In short, tonight's conversation is sure to be fascinating and could not be more timely or relevant. So I'd, I'd like to thank our distinguished panelists for joining us and for Joni Balter and Larry Hubble for once again moderating. And I'll now turn the virtual podium over to the Dean of Seattle University's College of Arts and Sciences, David Powers. Thank you, President Penalver. Uh, I'm happy and honored to be here. And we are, of course, very happy and honored to have President Penalver joining us back in his home state. Uh, he, as the 22nd president of Seattle University, we're quite honored to have you here with us tonight. Uh, as he said, this series has been an opportunity to host guests from around the region and around the country and the world who have committed their lives and careers to public service and to addressing key issues of the region, the country, and the world. Um, the College of Arts and Sciences has both graduate and undergraduate programs uh, based in a quality liberal arts education with graduate programs that really help students uh, have practical opportunities to address the issues, the current critical issues in our world today, uh, consistent with our Jesuit uh, university values. Um, the event tonight reminds us about how students can use their voice, their vote, uh, their actions, and dedicate their lives to impact the direction of our country. Um, as President Penalver mentioned, uh, homelessness has been an issue for a while and an important issue here in the city. Uh, Seattle University was the first university in the country to host the tent city back in 2005, and we're very honored to be part of the Project and Family Homelessness uh, from 2010 to 2020. Now let me introduce the panelists and the uh, interviewers. Uh, I'll start with Mayor Jenny Durkin. She's the 56th mayor of Seattle, becoming the city's first female mayor since the 1920s and its secondly openly, second openly LGBTQ elected mayor. She took office in November 2017 and before becoming mayor was appointed by President Barack Obama to be the US attorney for the Western District of Washington from 2009 to 2014. We're happy to have her back for this series. Mark Dones is the CEO of the King County Regional Homelessness Authority. 
They're a social entrepreneur, policy strategist, and social justice activist with 10 plus years of experience in equitable systems transformation across local, state, and federal governmental systems. Outside of direct systems transformation, Mark is a faculty member of the School of Visual Arts and leverages their experience as a keynote and panelist. They've spoken at the White House and Harvard University. Mark holds a degree from NYU in psychiatric anthropology and is a highly qualified equity trainer. Tiffany McCoy is the advocacy director for Real Change News. Real Change is a nonprofit organization advocating for economic, social, and racial justice. Since 1994, the award-winning weekly newspaper has provided an immediate employment opportunity for people who are experiencing homelessness and low income. Tiffany has a BS in sociology and two master's degrees, one in women's studies and the second in international affairs. She's an avid reader, mama to Vera, and loves traveling and working to change the world. John Scholes is the president and CEO of the Downtown Seattle Association. In November 2014, John Scholes became president and CEO of DSA following six years as the organization's vice president of advocacy and economic development. He believes downtown Seattle is an essential voice of leadership in a rapidly growing and evolving city. John's passion for taking on big issues is reflected in his 15 years of work in nonprofit advocacy, local government, and senior positions on statewide political campaigns. At DSA, he heads a diverse team focused on creating a healthy, vibrant, and inviting downtown. Those are our panelists. They will be interviewed by our two uh, distinguished interviewers, Dr. Larry Hubble, who's a professor and immediate past director of the Institute for Public Service at Seattle University. Prior to Seattle University, he was at the University of Washington, sorry, not the university, that other one in town, but the University of Wyoming. Apologies. In addition to his career, he worked for 10 years in the federal government at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Joni Balter is a multimedia journalist and lecturer who hosts Civic Cocktail, sponsored by Seattle City Club and the Seattle Channel. She's a regular on NPR affiliate KUOW's Week in Review and provides political analysis Friday mornings on KUOW, as well as contributing to Bloomberg Opinion. Joni is a professional in residence here at the Institute of Public Service at Seattle University and also teaches at the University of Washington's Evans Graduate School of Public Policy and Governance. Please join me in welcoming all our panelists and welcoming our interviewers, Larry and Joni, and I will hand it off to them. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, and thank you, audience and panelists, for attending today. But before I go any further, I have to make a disclaimer. And that is Seattle University does not support or oppose the positions of the speakers. Uh, this event, as David said, is sponsored by the College of Arts and Sciences and the Institute of Public Service. I would also like to tell the audience that the Institute offers a Master's of Public Administration program that is especially designed for mid-career professionals. Check us out on the Seattle University website. Okay, let me lay out the format for tonight. So we're gonna start off asking questions of all the panelists in, in a sort of kind of lightning round format. Then we will have longer, more directed questions to the panelists. This will be followed by giving each of the panelists the opportunity to ask one question of another panelist. Then we're gonna bring in two of our students, uh, one a graduate student, one an undergraduate, and they will ask questions of the panelists. So let me start with the first lightning round question. And we'll start, this will be first directed towards the mayor, then Tiffany, John, and Mark. So the question is this, given all the steps governments and nonprofits have taken, why is homelessness getting worse in the Seattle area? And please limit your response to about 30 seconds. Mayor. Thank you for that. I think there's a combination of factors we're seeing. The first, obviously, is the pandemic. It turned everything upside down and, and really stymied a lot of what we were doing. The second is, there. this is a very complex set of issues, and there's no one silver bullet. Um, we have to be a, the ability to, to really harness a whole range of things, but we have to make sure that we are really addressing what each individual unhoused person needs and not trying to address it as a monolithic problem. And the third is, I think that it has become such a difficult political issue that people are unwilling to really look at the humanitarian issues and how we get the solutions. Long-term, we know what we need, more affordable housing. That's the critical aspect. 
and with that, more behavioral health supports for the unhoused. Um, and I think if we can come together on the agreement on the principles, we really can make great progress. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Tiffany, you're next. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for having me on this panel. I would say that the reason um, homelessness is growing is that we have stagnant wages. We have a loss of a social safety net. We have a loss of deeply affordable housing. Housing is seen as a privilege and not right. The government has decided to allow business and the private market to dictate rents and not have this be seen as something that everyone needs. Everyone needs a roof over their head. And we're also the most regressive taxation uh, city in the entire nation. That means that poor and working class people pay a hell of a lot more than those at the very top. So we need to tap into that, turn that around and deeply invest in uh, affordable housing. I'd also say redlining, um, our zoning issues um, and just like deep structural racism that makes homeless uh, individuals um, that are outside disproportionately um, black and indigenous. Thank you, Tiffany. Uh, John, could we hear from you? Well, thanks, Larry. Thanks, Joni. And thanks to CLU for uh, organizing this and, and great to be with so many uh, committed, smart uh, leaders in our community. I, I think I, I agree with many of sort of the contributing factors. I think why we haven't made the progress that we all hope to see is we haven't moved fast enough to uh, stand up enough emergency housing and address the underlying issues, specifically mental illness and substance use disorder that's keeping many people outside. And, and the federal government, in some cases, the state government has, has really shoved this problem down to local government in the cities. And over many, many decades, the federal government has exited their responsibilities in investing in affordable housing and mental health treatment and the other you know, systems and programs that are so critical to keeping people uh, housed and having an economic opportunity and responding to uh, individuals that become unhoused. Thank you, John. Mark, you're up. Uh, thank you, and uh, thanks to everyone for having me tonight. Um, <clears throat> I, I would echo what others have said. I, you know, I think that oftentimes we forget that the fundamentals of homelessness are economic, um, and it is straightforwardly that people cannot afford housing. Um, in our region, we are one of the most expensive markets in the country, um, and the, the bottom line um, is that as, as the mayor, as John, as Tiffany have all said, right, we need to be producing more affordable housing. I cannot underscore what John said enough, that this is an abdication of responsibility at the federal level um, uh, for 50 plus years. Um, and so the expectation that any local government would be able to step into that and rapidly do anything is uh, um, not in line with budgets. So thanks a lot to all of you for uh, being part of this. Do you think the region has dedicated enough resources to the homelessness crisis? And we, we'll, we'll start with you, Mark. Uh, straightforwardly, no. <laughs> um, my, I mean, and I also say it's my job to say no. So no one can be mad at me tonight. Uh, um, I also want to thank. Just getting Eric rolling. <laughs> I, I also want to thank the mayor for uh, funding us above baseline in her budget. Thank you, mayor. Um, no, we haven't spent enough money, right? Like, and and part of the the you know again bottom line is that in an economic uh, formulated crisis, we need economic solutions, which means we need to be thinking about how we get money to people, um, and that is not necessarily a very expensive thing to run, but it does mean that you have to run it at scale, um, and we don't have the kind of investment necessary to do that. We have over-invested in service architecture and under-invested in people. Tiffany? Yeah, absolutely, we have not. Um, and while I sincerely hope and I'm excited about Mark uh, leading up this effort for the Regional Homelessness Authority, I think it was a huge failure to not give the Regional Homelessness Authority taxation power and to also give the suburban areas like governing rights when they are not contributing a dollar to the Regional Homelessness Authority. So you have 39 cities in the county and we, the city of Seattle and the King County Council are the only ones funding this effort. So if we as a region truly cared about solving this crisis, we would be putting our money where our mouth is. Mayor Durkin. So obviously we've not as a region or a country devoted enough resources, but I think we have to go back to what Mark said. 
And that is the federal government has not had a significant housing initiative for generations. Um, and we have seen in a city like Seattle, housing has become so expensive. So many people who are even middle wage earners can't afford to live in the city. We in the city though, have devoted more resources in the last four years to both homelessness and housing than ever in our city's history. Um, under my budget coming in, there was about $70 million the first year that I was mayor that was from the previous uh, city council. This last year, we had almost 200 million to emergency services. Over the four years as mayor, we invested a record amount of city resources that we were able to leverage to almost $2 billion in affordable housing. But we're not seeing the same effort come from the state or from the other cities. And that's why I'm such a big supporter of Mark Jones and a regional authority. We have to, as Tiffany said, make sure that the other cities are doing what Seattle is doing, building more affordable housing and having emergency services. But at the end of the day, we wanna to get to a point where we have to spend much less on emergency services and more on housing so people are housed. Um, and the state got, and I'll give one last pitch then I'll move Joni, but for example, the state got $400 billion from the federal government CARES Act. A bunch of cities, Seattle, Spokane, uh, uh, Everett, Tacoma went to the legislature and said, give us just 10% towards homelessness and housing so that we can really start to have the state solve this problem. And we weren't able to do it. So I'm hoping next legislative session, we see the state step up in an unprecedented way and the federal government step up. John Scholes, what do you think of this? Uh, we're, we're clearly spending more than we ever have at the local level, more than we were five years ago, more than we were two years ago. Uh, and as we look across the county over the last five years, the number of folks outside has grown by more than 40%. So I, I'm not sure it's the right metric to look at how much we're spending. I think we also need to look at what we're spending it on and the, and the results we're getting. It's very likely that we need to be spending more in King County and we need more state and federal investment, no doubt. Um, but I think we also need to be looking at what we're doing, what we're spending it on, uh, and are we making a difference for the folks who are outside? Are we investing enough in the in the services uh, that folks need? Are we standing up housing fast enough? And is, is the investments we're making in emergency housing enough as we also invest in permanent uh, supportive housing that's more expensive and takes more time? So uh, I, I think what we're spending it on is just as important as how much we're spending. So for all of you, um, and still on the, the tight 30 second um, rule, I guess, uh, do you favor forced removals of homeless encampments if there is a public safety issue? John? We need to open up our parks and public spaces by bringing people inside, not by chasing them around the city or from one park to the next or from one sidewalk to the other. Uh, but we certainly need to balance a set of interests in our city, the right for everybody to have access to our parks and public spaces. Uh, and the best way we can do that is by meeting the needs of people in those spaces today not telling them four or five years from now, we'll have a permanent supportive housing unit. And we hope that you can make it that long in the corner of Denny Park through a couple more winters. But today, uh, by investing in uh, housing that can be brought on uh, faster uh, and by providing services so that park and others can be open and that they're not chased to the next park uh, or down the street. Mayor Durkin, what's, what's the answer to this? Mayor, you're on mute. <laughs> um, I think the answer is what our policy has been. We lead with outreach and we do intensive outreach to go into encampments to give people the ability to come inside and offer every single person the ability to come in. Our experience is even after intensive outreach in most encampments, there will be some people who do not wanna move. And I think that if it is a park or another place or there's a public health and safety risk, then you have to tell the person choice. You can come inside, but you can't stay here. So I think the dichotomy that I think the whole sense of forced removals is really not the question. The question is, are we giving people the services they need? And if they aren't coming inside, what is the solution to get people inside? Tiffany. Yeah, thanks. I definitely wanted to jump in after uh, John's because I didn't hear an answer. My answer to this is no. Forced removals are not okay. Um, I also didn't hear the mayor answer this directly. It's just the same language we've heard for four years. Um, and saying that we lead with outreach is just 
such a blatant lie. Um, I met with a case uh, outreach worker this morning. There are eight beds in the city of Seattle available this morning. And he said, it's a good day today. And I'm like, wait, there's thousands of people outside. Still a good day. Usually it's two beds, three beds, four beds. So we are forcibly removing people. We are sweeping people when there's no place else for them to go. And this policy of shuffling people from one neighborhood to the next has only resulted in further harming an already traumatized and struggling community. And we also know that contact with the police during sweeps is more likely to turn fatal for people with disabilities, people of color, especially black people. So folks living outside in public places need to be offered services that are appropriate to their specific need. And we know that that isn't happening, full stop. Mark. Uh, my answer is no, but after that, my answer is John's answer. So, uh, you know, I think that uh, we we historically, right, like have not offered people the right stuff. Like it's that's very straightforward. <laughs> like, um, and and so this question of you know what's to be done, what's to be done? Well, you offer people the right stuff, <laughs> and and uh, determining what that right stuff is is work. Um, but it isn't rocket science, right? We have really uh, uh, dedicated and passionate folks who've been doing direct service, um, some of whom are in leadership positions. I do outreach sometimes, right? Like talking to people and figuring out what they need is is uh, is a thing that is very doable. The question, and I, I think, you know, the, the mayor and, and John and, and Tiffany have all touched on this. The question is, do our investments line up with what people tell us they need, right? Um, and, uh, and, again, to this uh, point around the generational deficit from the federal level, can they line up with what people say that they need? So uh, let's move on to the sort of more directed questions. Not everybody will answer this one, just to be clear. Uh, some neighborhoods in Seattle are riled up about RVs parked in front of or near their, their homes. What should we do about this? Uh, Tiffany, you go first. Yeah, we should have a policy. <laughs> about what to do with folks who live in their RVs and their vehicles. Um, we haven't had an actual um, fit to scale program implemented by this city and by this mayor to address the more than 2000 people that are living in their vehicles. We know that the, the population that is growing in, um, in the one night counts every year is those that are living in their vehicles because that is like a safe place. That's a place to have refuge. You could be proud, that's your home. Um, we don't have a policy at all. We trickle money into this issue, a, a, a couple million here, a few hundred thousand here for 10 to 12 beds. It's setting it up for failure. We need to create models like um, are in Austin, Texas with the bread and lo or loaves and fishes community um, RV park that has um, places, tiny house villages, it has wraparound services, case management, showers. Um, toilets, places to wash your clothing, and also RV spots um, for folks to park their vehicle and, and people coming to do job trainings and, and uh, employment opportunities. We need to be setting up something to that scale because this is a population that we always ignore and just pretend that they're not there. Um, but it, they are there and it's proliferating. And we also see hostile architecture taking over uh, where we have these eco blocks that are being put up all over um, Soto, all over Georgetown, now outside of places in, in Wallingford and Fremont. And, and this, is, this is hostile. This is telling these people, you do not have a right to survive. We need to actually take a holistic approach to this population. And I'm hoping that the okay. RHA will do that because we just won money through some of the federal dollars through Mosqueda's office. And that is not being spent by this mayor. Mayor Durkin, you're the other person on this question. So I think we got to do a little um, grounding the truth here. And I really appreciate the work that Tiffany has done. And I think that real change, being advocates is really important. But a couple of things. First, it is absolutely untrue that we don't leave without reach and don't offer people a place to come inside. And that has been the policy and the fact since the pandemic began. Second is we have over 4,000 people living outside in the city of Seattle. We do not have enough shelter beds to bring everybody inside. And so if people really want everyone housed, we have to have a serious regional, state, and federal conversation. Our, you know, when I came in, we realized I thought we'd be able to build a thousand tiny homes. 
but we realized what we really needed was enhanced shelter. When I came in, the majority of shelter was mats on the floor, very inhumane, didn't have support services, wasn't 24 seven. Now 92% of our shelter beds are enhanced, but shelter is not housing. And so we have to build more affordable housing at scale, but Seattle can't do it alone. There's no budget in any city big enough. Um, and if, if that is going to be our goal, we have to realize we've got to harness the other powers. I also think that it's, it is, you know, I agree. I, I want to give Mark all the tools he needs going forward to build it regionally, but it can't be just regionally. I've talked to the mayors in Spokane, Vancouver, Bellingham, Everybody is seeing this problem increase because we are in a changing economy. And so I think the more we focus on the actual facts and the actual solutions, the better we will be. Uh, Mark, I, this say, Joni, I'm, I'm, I did not hear the mayor at all address vehicle residents um, or folks that live in their RVs. That was the direct question. And I really would love to hear a response on that. Appreciate that. I'll just take like uh, 20 seconds on RV parks. So on RVs, we've got to do more about vehicles, absolutely. But two things can be real. People can need shelter and housing and RVs is the last place they need shelter. And they can have significant negative impacts on a community. And we have to address both. Um, and I think it's wrong to, to suggest that those two realities don't exist because that's what's polarizing this discussion. We have to both be cognizant of the real impacts on a community and on the impacts of the people who are forced to live in vehicles. Larry. Mark, this question is for you. Uh, what do you want to do about the uh, this, uh, safe lot uh, program that allows people to live in vehicles, uh, to park, to legally park and sleep in their vehicles? I mean, I think safe parking is a uh, one of the few national best practices we have. <laughs> so uh, for folks who are, who are living in vehicles. So you know, I've, I've been, I think, clear consistently um, that we do need to have safe parking programs. Um, but I also want to be clear, and I think this builds off the conversation that just happened, safe parking is not, is not sufficient, right? Um, and so, you know, we need to be really clear um, in terms of our engagement with folks who are living in vehicles to, again, hear from them what their needs are, a few weeks ago, my team and I did uh, some outreach with the Scofflaw mitigation team, directly working with people who were living in vehicles and RVs to get a better sense of, of what folks uh, uh, were, were seeing. Um, and from that have begun to develop uh, a more complex multi, um, multi-pronged strategy. Um, but broadly, I, you know, I think the answer, I think the answer on this, you know, hearkening back to the, the opening question of there is no silver bullet, the answer in almost every conversation about homelessness is yes and, right? Like there, there are very few things, um, you know, sweeps is one, right? But like, but there are very few things where you're going to hear from, I think anybody on this panel, a categorical no. Um, it will mostly be a yes and. And, and I think that when we talk about folks who are living uh, in vehicles, um, you know, there is a, a specific set of dynamics and complex needs, frankly, often that are medical, that are um, different from the medical needs that we see for folks who are living unsheltered in encampments. And the responsiveness to those medical needs requires a slightly different kind of um, uh, skill set. Um, I think we also, frankly, have seen that um, when people have a vehicle, that vehicle is their lifeline, right? And so much of what we need to acknowledge is that there is no good incentive, right, to give up a vehicle um, that is your lifeline for, as Mayor Durkin said, a mat on a floor. That just doesn't make sense, right? Um, and so we have not provided people with an option they can actualize with any reasonable logic, right? Um, and so the step away from basic shelter is a step. But again, I, I cannot, I cannot do anything other than double down on it has to be beyond shelter, right? Like we have to be having a conversation beyond shelter. And until we are with enough dollars behind it to make it a real conversation, um, then it remains, um, you know, the, the theories of smart people that cannot be actualized to support the people who need us. So John Scholes, um, perhaps the biggest crunch point on homelessness, or this is one of the, the big crunch points, is in our parks. Many people are new or don't remember, but you know, voters, I think it's seven years ago, approved a huge park district uh, so the whole city could enjoy the parks. Have we broken that agreement? 
Yeah, I think we have. And I think that's where the, the interests that we're trying to balance here are, are important. And, and so we, we want to meet people where they are with the services they need. We, we do need to, I think, provide the, the things that people want. And we, for a long time, we've relied on congregate shelter, as Mark noted. And, you know, you got to show up downtown at 7 a.m., 7 p.m., wait in line. Maybe you get a spot. And then the next morning, you got you to get out of there. You can't bring your dog. There's no place for your stuff. And, oh, by the way, there's no treatment and much support for you. And, and then we sort of scratched our head for years and years why no one wanted that. And... And so I, I think we're trying to balance interest. And I, and I think there's a mindset shift here that we need to take as a community that the situation we face out on the streets today in, in many respects, I think is a parallel public health pandemic to the one that we're vaccinating away through, through in, with coronavirus. But this one's not gonna go away with a vaccine. And with any you know, public health crisis, our approach is always about what's the best intervention? What's the intervention that works? We didn't say let's fight coronavirus with the cheapest intervention. We said what works? What is the best intervention that we can provide to protect the public's health and deal with this crisis? And I'm not sure we've taken that same approach when it comes to this broader public health crisis uh, that's on our streets that we've shorthanded with the term homelessness. Uh, but I think I'll acknowledge that there's a lot going on there uh, in addition to people not having homes. Um, so what's the best intervention that, and most effective that works um, to open our parks and bring people inside? I think that's what we have to be asking ourselves. And I think for too long, we sort of get trapped in these silly debates over, you know, RVs here, or there, or tiny homes. And this dysfunction is why the public's so damn frustrated. And I've been to that project in Austin. It's called First Community. It's incredible. The number of RVs there pales in comparison to the number of housing units they have there. The answer for people in RVs is housing. Tiffany, uh, what's your view about uh, traditional shelters, mass on the floor, that sort of thing? Do I, do I like them or? Would you favor continuing them? Would you favor doing away with them, expanding them? Yeah. I would favor doing away with them. And I think that's a silver lining of the pandemic as we've realized how almost inhumane Matt on the floor, the six to six, not being able to bring your family all the time or your partner or your pets or your belongings. Um, we have a lot of uh, veterans that are vendors at Real Change that have PTSD. They don't wanna sleep on a mat on the floor next to someone. We have folks fleeing domestic violence situations. They don't wanna be sleeping next to someone on the floor. We need to move away wholly from that. And that's where, when like John talks about investments and what we need to be funding, the, the Compassion Seattle's approach was 2000 emergency shelter beds with no funding attached to it. So what were those going to be? Um, they were going to be emergency shelter potentially mount on the floor because again, no funding behind it. So if you truly want to solve this crisis, we have to solve it with money and we have to offer people what they want um, and what they need to get inside and to where they feel safe and where there are relationships built and trust. And trust with the unhoused community, with the city has been, has been broken and that needs to be rebuilt. And we need to take that approach holistically and prop up more tiny house villages and RV safe lots. But we need deeply, deeply affordable housing that is publicly owned. We need social housing, we need um, the public to take ownership of housing and start moving away from the private market. Like capitalism and the private market are not going to solve this crisis. So Mark, if mats on the floor uh, type shelters are less and less in favor and you're just, everybody's saying that, um, what would happen? You know, we, we would move away from um, the existing shelters. Is that right? What would we do with those programs? Would they just continue as sort of the sort of lowest level of the approach? Because you said and for everything, everything is yes and. Well, I need, to, I need to, first I need to just echo something that Mary Durkin said, which is we don't really operate that anymore, right? Like we had stopped operating basic shelters by and large before the pandemic started. Um, what we have done uh, post the pandemic is go farther and it's amazing and we need to keep going, right? 
Um, but I just think it's really important that people be clear that truly the vast majority of the shelter system operated in King County is not a basic shelter system anymore. Um, and that is that is a testament not to my work, that is a testament to the mayor's work, to the work of real change, to the work of many, many, many people um, who drove the system to, to shift long before I got here. Um, so I just want to be really clear about that. Um, I do want to say though that like, you know, in, in, as Tiffany said, the, the pandemic, you know, crisis is the mother of opportunity, right? And one of the things the pandemic showed us, um, is that we do have more capacity and more creativity than frankly, we've allowed ourselves to tap into with regard to folks experiencing homelessness. And some of that was inside hotel motel acquisition. Some of that was inside the expansion um, of non-congregate spaces, right? And the creation of these really, really, um, I think, uh, genuinely therapeutic spaces, which I think is, you know, to John's point about like sort of what is the thing that we're offering people and how does it match what their needs are? Um, some of that I think is, is in the space itself. Um, I think the vision that the authority has uh, for shelter and for the system writ large, right, is you have a menu and your menu needs to match what people are asking for. And so what we really wanna see is um, an array of enhanced shelter options, right? Some of that can be tiny home villages. Some of that can be, uh, you know, things like um, the new Cairo shelter or uh, the Soto shelter, right? Um, but those are all different kinds of shelters that operate in an enhanced shelter way and can provide people with specific kinds of, of um, uh, responses to needs that they evidence. But what we really, again, need to need to be focused on is what happens after shelter? Like right currently, I want to be really clear with, with, with everyone listening in. Currently, the uh, system-wide capacity in King County is around 4,600 beds. We operate that at around a 75% capacity um, due to predominantly some COVID deintensification stuff, but then also because there are some spaces that people are still just like, oh, that's not what I want, right? And the thing that I want is not available. Um, but right to John's point and to the mayor's point, there are um, thousands, when we look across the county, not just Seattle, there are thousands of people in unsheltered positions tonight, right? Um, and the reason they have nowhere to go is the people who are in shelter have nowhere to go. So like there is a fundamental breakdown in the system architecture, which is not in shelter. It is in what is after shelter. And so the consistent drive to create a larger, more complex, more Byzantine shelter system is a, a losing strategy. And we have many, many, many municipalities that have pursued that strategy and are now a billion dollars in to a shelter system that they can't pivot away from. That's New York, yeah. Yeah, and I, Jenny, I'm gonna jump in there and I just gotta echo, Mark's exactly right. Um, and when I came in as mayor, we saw that just to build affordable housing, one unit of affordable housing took about $325,000 to $350,000 a unit in three years to build. We were just now with a rapid acquisition able to buy you know, apartment buildings that didn't pencil out. So now we can, can convert them quickly, um, but it's still $300,000 a unit. But we know that permanent supportive housing works and there's a key need for that. Um, and we added significant amounts of that in the last four years. And we have another 800 units plus coming online, but that still isn't enough. We have to scale the housing to the need. Otherwise, all we're doing is creating a longer holding pattern that's more Byzantine, um, adds to the trauma, adds to the cost, and is not an investment in the housing and services people need. That doesn't mean we don't need emergency shelter because we do. But we also have to start having it outside of Seattle. If you look at what's being spent right now on an emergency shelter, Seattle is the lion's share. And if you look at the data, about six out of 10 of the people that we are serving, um, their last place of stable housing was outside of Seattle. They became homeless somewhere else, but because we have the services here and it's what is the right thing to do. So that's why we have, you know, Mark's got a lot on his shoulders but we've got to really pivot away from just emergency shelter and all Seattle centric. Mayor, this question's for you. And it's about the mayoral race. The two candidates for mayor disagree on homelessness policy. Now, let me just highlight two elements of, of their policy. One is uh, Bruce Harrell is basically for the compassion Seattle approach, even though it's not on the ballot. 
Lorraine's, Lorena Gonzalez said that under her administration, there will be no coercive removals of homeless campus. Which approach do you think is better for Seattle's future? I think it oversimplifies it. And I think one of the reasons we are stuck where we're stuck is everybody wants to get on the slogan bandwagon instead of doing solutions. And I think that Mark is exactly right. We have to do an and, and, and. You know, for example, you know, I know Tiffany's gonna disagree with this, but I believe that in four years, we've never really done a sweep. If a sweep is, you don't get a choice, we're not gonna do any retreat, we're not gonna offer you housing, that's a sweep. Miller Playfield, we went in there for three weeks and offered people a place to live, including tiny house villages. Um, we've had people turn down hotel rooms. At the end of the day, we've been able to place a lot of people in services but at the end of the day, as Tiffany knows, some people just say, no, I don't want to come inside. And they have different reasons to do it. But then you have to make the decision, can they stay where they are? And I do believe there are some places that we have to have open spaces for our public to enjoy. Um, and we have to make sure that we're working both of those things together to have parks and sidewalks open for public enjoyment, but also really working to make sure that we address the fundamental humanitarian issues underlying homelessness. So I'm going to I'm going to jump ahead because of uh, time crunch and point out, Larry, it's almost 8:15, which when we want to do this other deal. So let me just go question. to Tiffany. Um, mental health, you know, is often at the center of the problem on the streets. What are the top three things, Tiffany, that we can do to improve behavioral health problems on the street? Real quick, because we got to. Yeah. Yeah. I just got to jump in and I wanted to, but you said we're trying to wrap up. Um, well, no, don't try to wrap up. We're trying to get to a different. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Of, but the idea that a sweep all. hasn't happened in four years is absolutely astonishing to me. We've been part of lawsuits with the ACLU against sweeps that are happening in the city of Seattle. I have countless testimony from vendors of all of their possessions being taken from them forcibly during a sweep. So the idea that this hasn't happened is like the narrative is, it's really taking me back. Um, it's the so truth, we, Tiffany. We got to figure out what a sweep is defined as. I know you want to call it a clean, but a clean, a forced removal, a sweep, they're all the same. You are moving someone from point A to point B without shelter. And this, and this perpetuating of service resistance is incredibly um, irresponsible, in my opinion. As I said earlier today, there were eight shelter beds available in the city of Seattle, and we have thousands of people on the street. This isn't about service resistance. This is about a lack of resources. And for behavioral health, I'll say the same thing. It's a lack of resources, and being swept is traumatizing. It can, it can really mess with your brain. You can not want to leave your tent because you are afraid of everything being taken and get a UTI like a vendor of ours did because they've come back too many times to their tent and it's gone and their child's baby teeth are taken, their birth certificate is taken, the last picture of their mother, their ashes of their loved ones. Like this is what happens um, actually on the ground. So yes, behavioral health is important. I agree that it's a federal issue. I agree that the state isn't doing enough we can do more, but it's going to cost money. And anyone telling you otherwise is lying to you. I, can I hop in real quickly? Yeah, that'll get us right to, yeah. I just need to, I need to echo uh, one thing that Tiffany said, which is just that like, you know, there has been a consistent hot potato on like who's going to do behavioral health for people experiencing homelessness. And that has to stop. It kills people. And the, the bottom, right, the, the authority right now has a pending request in front of Seattle City Council to fund high acuity shelter beds, which are beds that we are going to wrap the service infrastructure around um, with psychiatric nurse practitioners, et cetera, right, in order to be able to actually respond to people who have significant co-occurring disorders, right? So that's folks who might be experiencing a psychotic spectrum illness and also using meth, right? And the bottom line is we actually don't have anywhere for those folks to be right now. And so when I get the calls or the emails when the mayor or John or Tiffany get the calls and the emails being like, I see this person who's in distress, right? The, the literal bottom line is that person has had nowhere to go. Um, and so the authority is stepping into this and saying, 
it like we can't do hot potato. We can't figure out whose responsibility it is. We have to wrap our arms around the people who need our support. Um, and so we are really interested in creating that infrastructure. But I also want to be really clear as a person with significant mental health issues who's been institutionalized twice, who takes the mood stabilizer every day, right? That the bottom line, right, is that for me, when I was hospitalized, I went from a house to the hospital and left the hospital to a house. That's the thing, right? Like we don't have this conversation about people who decompensate in their living rooms. And just real quickly, the investments that Mark's proposing there are the exact ones we need for the population downtown. Not that there aren't individuals in other parts of our city and county dealing with this, but th this is the population that we have downtown. Mental health challenges, meth addiction, heroin addiction, uh, and we need those services. It's beyond a uh, shelter or a tiny home or a place to park an RV to meet the needs of these individuals. Our last question will be for John. Um, John, as the pandemic recedes further, how much will the problem of homelessness decrease on its own? Well, I think we've already seen growing pressure, which I think should inspire us to have more urgent action and investment and be investing in the right things because this was a problem we entered the pandemic with. The pandemic in many ways has made it worse. I think we look at a 12 month period in the US over um, these most recent 12 months, we had 100,000 people die of drug overdoses, a record. In King County, we're gonna have more than 600 people die of drug overdoses this year, a record above the 520 or so lives that were lost last year. The challenges around mental health continue to grow. So the pandemic uh, and the after effects of it are not going to make uh, our jobs any easier in making progress on this issue, which is why we need to be more united as a community, the public and private sector, investing in the things that we know work. And again, approaching this like a public health crisis. We should use the same playbook that we use to effectively address coronavirus in Seattle and King County. And credit to the mayor and County Executive Constantine and others. We've got a great playbook, collaboration, urgency, focus. Let's, let's all acknowledge the crisis we face. Let's adjust our course. Let's measure our progress. You know, you can go to every, any kind of dashboard right now and know exactly how many cases, how many hospitalizations, the demographics, how many people have been vaccinated. We should have a similar dashboard when it comes to this crisis. So we've got a great recipe. We've got a great playbook. We've got a good track record. Let's, let's take the same approach because the pandemic is only gonna increase the pressure um, on a problem that uh, was a challenging one uh, 20 months ago and has only uh, become more challenging. Okay, so now we're finishing that part of the program and we're moving to the part of the program where we get to, we get to reverse the table a little bit. You, all of you get asked a lot of questions. We're gonna give you an opportunity to ask one question of one of the other panelists and we're gonna do it in the order of the mayor will go first, then John, then Tiffany, and then Mark. So Mayor, do you have a question for uh, one of the panelists? Yeah, my question is for Mark Downton is, what can we all do to make you successful? So oh, nice. Uh, <laughs> I, um, you know, I think the thing that we, we have to do as a community is, um, and you know, we've all said it in one way or another, but we have to get out of binary thinking about like, there, this is right, that is wrong, right? Um, we're way past that point way past that point, right? Like, like we could have had that conversation in like 1997 when none of us were doing this work, right? Um, but the, the bottom line is that in 2021, the complexity of what we're doing right now is it is about a menu. It is not about a right or wrong. There, there are a, a balancing set of priorities that need to be managed and a community conversation that has to hit a level of complexity um, to hold all of those things with uh, and leave behind, frankly, the toxicity um, that we are mired in around like you know, who did what thing and, and sort of what history, like we, we need to, we need that sort of cultural reset as a community around this conversation. Um, and so my ask to anyone who's listening to all of you and all the influence that you wield is like, when people start to wind down that rabbit hole, like just ask them to press pause and ask them, what is a solution you would like to see and get them having that conversation instead. Thank you, John. 
I'll pick on Mark as well because they're new. They're they're newest on the on the scene here. Uh, and, and maybe it's a sort of different take on the mayor's question. But the mayor's proposed her budget for 2022. Mark, you mentioned what you need out of uh, the council around those high acuity beds and the investment. What else do you need out of the city council this month, next month, to be successful in 2022 as you stand up the regional authority? Uh, we also have an ask for uh, a peer navigation line item in order to uh, provide, I think, as, as Tiffany mentioned, some of the relational architecture to help people really navigate um, uh, the system. Um, and I think, you know, uh, I will I will go uh, sort of beyond the, the budget season right in front of us with council and say what I really really need um, is for everyone to use their political capital capital to like triple our budget. Like that's the amount of money we should be spending. <laughs> um, and that is not Seattle's money. Uh, and it's probably not the county's money. That is state money. That is federal money, right? Um, and, and, you know, that that's the reality. That's the amount when I do the just basic math at providing services across the county that are aimed towards housing outcomes, like we are talking about triple the operating budget we're going to walk into 2022 with. Tiffany? Yeah, I, uh, I'm going to actually ask this one of, of John, and I'm just very curious what your John personally or you as representing the Downtown Seattle Association's position is on the McKinsey report a couple years ago that says that we need 450 million to a billion dollars a year for 10 years to start actually digging ourselves out of our housing crisis. Um, I'm curious what your takeaway is from that specific point in the report that was commissioned by the Chamber of Commerce. We, we clearly need more housing in Seattle and across King County. We need more federal investment in housing, more state investment in housing. And I think we need to make it just generally easier to build housing in Seattle. The city council controls land use in, in the city of Seattle, not the business community. Uh, the business community, we'd like to see lots more housing. We'd like to see it uh, be a lot easier and faster to build housing. So we're pro-housing. We want to see more housing. Uh, and I think we need a range of tools and strategies to deliver it. Mark, you're last. I'm going to ask the mayor a question. Um, I, uh, I'm super curious. I don't think people know that, like, you know, so I helped architect the authority in 2018, worked very closely with the mayor on that. Um, and uh, I think you have been dealt as a public official, one of the weirdest possible hands <laughs> that anyone could have been dealt. Um, and you're you're headed out, and I'm just curious, what do you know now that you wish you had known then, and and what, frankly, like parting wisdom on complexity and navigation um, based on things that went well, didn't go well, would you give us? Yeah, that's a great question. I think you're right. I mean, I don't think anyone could have foreseen the the what happened. I think the pandemic coming in 2020 change the landscape for everything. Um, we were already in a time of such great disparity in Seattle and it just really shone a great light. And that disparity, you know, was mostly in our communities of color, particularly our black community and the health and economic impacts of COVID were the same. I think the thing that I've learned is we have become so polarized in any of our discussions and debates that if you can get people quiet and actually talk about what they want as their goals, like we talked tonight, enhanced housing is better. Okay, let's go make that happen. We don't want to move people from here to there. Then let's figure out a way where that doesn't have to happen. I think everyone agrees that in an ideal world, our parks and public spaces would be open for people to enjoy and people wouldn't be in their tents on those places. So I think I'm, my hope is, is that we can move to a place where the dialogue can actually focus on what is the results we need for the people who need this. The, every single unhoused person has a story they are there for a reason and we need to address this. And we have to quit thinking that Seattle can do it by itself or King County can do it by itself. There has got to be unprecedented resources and pressure has to be put on the federal government and the state government um, because we need, as Tiffany said, we need so much more affordable housing than we have that people can rely on. And they know they either can have minimum wage or no wage because they're on disability and they're not going to lose their home. And so I think focus on housing, housing, housing has got to be a unified effort. 
Well, thank you all. You have us actually on schedule here. So Larry and I right now, it's time for us to yield to our students, Sean Watkins. He's an MPA student at Seattle University. He works also for Catholic Housing Services and John O. Jackson, sophomore majoring in international studies and public affairs. So take it away, John O. And uh, Sean, you'll be next, but uh, John O, you state who your uh, question is for and have some fun. Thank you, Joni. Uh, my question is for you, John. Now that the Compassion Seattle Amendment will not be on the November ballot, is the Downtown Seattle Association planning any new, any new ballot measures to propose down the road? And if not, what's next for the DSA on the policy front? I think we should elect the candidates that support the approach uh, that was articulated in the Charter Amendment. And that's really the opportunity in front of voters in this uh, election coming up. The judge said you can't change the city's approach to homelessness by way of a charter amendment, so we have to change who's in charge. Thankfully, voters have an opportunity to do that in November. Sean? Hi, thank you. Uh, so my question is for Mark, and um, you've, you've answered part of this question already, Mark, but I want to know what the homeless authority is prepared to do to make sure that once we stand up this housing and we house these folks, that these folks remain stably housed. We know that a lot of folks coming into housing from being unsheltered have significant barriers to housing stability, um, whether that be behavioral barriers, uh, substance use disorder barriers. And oftentimes these folks return back to homelessness from our housing programs. This is a reality. We deal with it every day. Um, and, and too often permanent supportive housing is, hey, there's a case manager on site, but you have somebody that has a significant mental health disorder that that person's not equipped uh, to, to properly help. So what do we do to make sure that we're not creating another crisis when we're housing these folks that they don't return back to homelessness? Yeah, that's a great question. The um, reality is, is that housing stabilization, housing permanency is a relationship question. It's not actually a, a, a physical question. Um, and so most often when we see people return to homelessness from housing, um, the two driving factors of that are um, we have moved them via housing placement somewhere that's quite distant from their community um, and not provided any uh, connection, right? And so a lot of folks quite literally will move into an apartment um, you know, a different county, you know, whatever, um, and then feel very isolated, feel very unsure. And then, you, you know, frankly, and this is a, this is a, I want to be really clear, this is a logical human decision. Um, they return to the community that, that uh, they understand and that understands them. Uh, and the other reason that we often see folks uh, destabilized in housing placements is because um, something goes pretty disastrously wrong. And oftentimes when you peel that onion, what you find out is someone like didn't know how to do a thing and was afraid to ask anybody how to do it. Um, and so the, the reality there, right, is that in both instances, those are solved relationally, not with um, some sort of fancy new, I don't know, whatever. Um, and so part of the reason why the authority is really keen on peer navigation is we really see that as an end-to-end -end, uh, support, right? Meaning you have the same person um, when you are in an encampment, you have the same person when you are housed. Um, and so the relationship is solid enough that you can reach out to them and say, I mean, this is a, a story that I literally heard the other day. Someone almost burned down their apartment because they were afraid to ask how to work a microwave. The reason they didn't know how to work a microwave is they'd been outside for 20 years, right? Like, um, and so the having a person who you trust to be like, I don't know how this works, right? Is actually something that most of us avail, of, uh, avail ourselves of in our lives broadly, right? Like many things I don't know how to do, my partner does, right? Like my the desk I'm standing at right now was not put together for three weeks until he came and put it together. So like, that's just a true thing that most of us don't actually think about as being a critical life support. Um, and so that is the way that we understand housing stabilization is by leaning into relationships. Donald. Mayor Durkin, my question is for you. I'd like to go back to the issue of parks. Since you became mayor, the presence of homeless encampments in Seattle parks has grown. Do you take any personal responsibility for this development? And do you think that enough has been done to ensure the safety of both the housed and unhoused in city parks? So I think that we saw when, before COVID hit, um, we had done, a, I think, a very good job of working both in our parks 
and in our public spaces to make sure that people could enjoy public spaces um, and that we were really doing a lot of outreach to people. As you know, when COVID hit, the CDC guidelines, the recommendations were that you should leave encampments in place. And so we put the policy in place based on the public health guidance that we got, that we should not remove encampments unless there was a real public health or safety issue. Um, and that's why people saw that together with the fact that we saw, um, and I'm gonna disagree a little bit with people in saying that they think homelessness has gotten worse. I think it has, but I think what you've seen in Seattle is visible homelessness has gotten worse. But many of those people were already unhoused. They were living in green belts and other places. And they came and congregated in places where we now have visible homelessness and have to confront that. So I believe that we should be able to have our public spaces available for public enjoyment. And our goal should be to do that and to also make sure that we're doing the right outreach. And as John and Mark and, and Tiffany have said, have the right places for people to go. But we also need there to be the, you know, we have so many people that hit shelter, but then had no housing to go to. It is housing, housing, housing. And until we address that issue, we will not get ahead of this problem. Sean? Yeah, this uh, question is for Tiffany. And so Tiffany, I'd, I'd like to hear your take on, on this. So a, a large number of the population that lives in downtown who are homeless meet the definition of chronically homeless. Um, they've either been homeless for a very long time or they've had multiple episodes of homelessness um, in, in a specified period of time. And, and many of them have been connected with homeless service providers for years. And, and some of these folks, multiple agencies, um, and, and, and still they're not housed. And so I'm wondering where we're failing um, as service providers in our outreach efforts to really uh, reach these folks and get them um, with some type of permanency with housing. Yeah, that's a great question. And um, I, I know that you didn't uh, intend it this way, like service providers, outreach workers, um, case managers are overworked, underpaid, don't have enough resources. And um, like the coordinated entry system is something that needs an overhaul and I'm really excited about Mark uh, and the Regional Homelessness Authority taking that on. Um, I would also say that, uh, I mean, yes, behavioral health is an issue. Uh, mental health is an issue. We know that that's chronically underfunded, but we also know that based on low wages, there's high turnover in outreach workers. Um, and that breaks bonds, that breaks, breaks relationships. I would also wanna know how many of these folks that are coming into the downtown corridor are coming there because they've been swept. We know that folks are being swept from point A to point B. You have Ballard Commons now over in the U District. You have folks from the City Hall Park now over on 2nd Avenue. This is the, the game that we keep playing. So um, we need to invest in outreach workers. We need to invest in the people that are doing that trauma-informed care directly on the ground. And we do need to build up a lot more permanent supportive housing. And, and also, and I know a lot of us agree on this, we also need to like cut off homelessness before it starts. We need to, we need to prevent that pipeline from even beginning because you have like just the, the, the toll it takes on you to lose your house. Like we need to sit with that more. Um, so yeah, that's not a straightforward answer. It's not a, it's not, a, it's a great question. It's super complex, but I mean, even, yeah, I mean, I have a story about what just happened in the U District too, with uh, outreach workers being told that the new tiny house village there was going to go to the folks that are unhoused in the U District. And now actually those houses are now going to go to the HOPE team and they're going to be from folks that are going to be swept from Green Lake and Ballard Commons. So that trust has now been broke between outreach workers in the U District for the past 10 months that they've been working with the, our unhoused neighbors there. So we need a massive overhaul um, and that I'm excited about the what the RHA can do with that. Okay, Jono. My question's for Mark. I'd like to go uh, back just in the spirit of services. Can you talk about how um, you measure up services as opposed to housing when it comes to funding and without enough money in the budget should we expect services to lag behind housing initiatives? Um, I 
if I understand the question correctly, right, it's um, how do how do we evaluate at the authority, right, like sort of service expenditure versus uh, like physical expenditure? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, you know, I I think um, we don't. I mean, like straightforwardly, right? Like I I can't afford to think that way. Um, and uh, because the reality is, right, that like they are they are in integrated and necessary. Um, and what I have said for 15 ish years um, is that the work that we have done in the homelessness space has over indexed on services and under indexed on on housing right. Um, there is no number of social workers that like transform into a house like that's not the degree you don't become a transformer like that's not what an MSW does for you. Um, on the other hand, right, what we also know is that there is a need for housing stabilization support. I just finished talking about the need for that, that high acuity work. And so I'm going to point you to John's answer and say, the question is not which one. The question is, is it the right stuff? Um, and so much of the menu that we offer, I believe, um, could be radically overhauled. But it doesn't mean that we will be doing the sort of like, oh, like it's this or that, right? Um, crisis governance is not like, you can't, you can't like, which is what we're in, by the way, just to be clear, this is a crisis. This is very bad. <laughs> like, um, and crisis governance is, is uh, a form of, of governance response that really requires you to, to practice the discipline of both at almost every juncture. <laughs> um, and so I know that that's an unsatisfying answer because I think what people want is the idea that there is a choice, but at this point, at this depth of crisis, the choice is false, right? It is always about what is the right stuff? What is the menu? How do we build out that menu by saying yes to almost everything at once? Can I add just one thing real briefly to that? And you talk about the right stuff in the menu and, and one piece of that that we haven't talked about much today and I don't think we talk about or focus enough on as a community is employment and job training. And it's not the right stuff for everybody that's outside today, but it's the right stuff for a lot of people. And I say that in working for an organization for 20 years that's employed hundreds of people and today employs more than 100 folks that have had interactions with the criminal legal system and or experienced homelessness. And they um, are paying for their housing. They've got 401k. They've got health care. They've got a bus pass. Uh, and they are not, uh, for the most part, living in permanent supportive and fully subsidized housing units. And so those then are available for people who really, really need them. And we, we don't do enough to talk about employment and job training uh, as a community. There's great organizations from Fair Start to Pioneer Human Services and others that are helping people out of tents and out of parks and off the sidewalks. Uh, into employment, and we're not writing off the purpose that people still have uh, and the contributions they can make in our community. And it means then we're freeing up resources for permanent supportive housing uh, and expensive housing for the folks who really, really need it. I want to add just one thing to that. I think one thing that Mark is, is looking at and that is critical that we've been trying to do for years and haven't been able to do it is a by name list for those most chronic people because We'll, we'll have instances where the same person sees two or three or four case managers or outreach workers or goes to different shelter systems. Um, and if we have one person that we can say, what is it you need? And we're tracking what that person needs. We will be far more successful than a system where people can just float between things and, and we never know exactly what it is they need. And it's also accountability, right? Like if I know what you need, I also know if we did it. <laughs> like <laughs> If you tell me this is what I need, and then two months later, I pull up that case file and that has not been done, then like, we didn't do our jobs, right? And like, and so like, oftentimes the data conversation gets lost because it feels wonky, but like it is fun, that is government accountability, right? Like that is how I tell you as the authority CEO that we came to work today. <laughs> Right. And it's reciprocal accountability, too. So people say, this is what I get. And then that didn't work for me. I need this other thing instead. And so your human conditions are never static. They are changing. Um, and we can't expect people who've been on TAOs, particularly for a period of years, who, who have cumulative traumas, to be able to say, OK, I need X and it's all going to work. It takes time and is very complex.
And we need to be sure that we're not doing data for data's sake. Um, I've heard from outreach workers as well that folks who are having very clear mental health crises on the street are not the people that outreach workers are necessarily going to go to first to work with because mm -hmm. it's all about those numbers. It's all about those data sets to prove to the city that you met X and X quota so that you can get your money for the next year. So actually some of this data is being set up to do harm because then these folks who actually need help the most at that moment and a response that's not a police force, but like a crisis health response isn't happening because not because the outreach worker doesn't care or want to help that person, but always in the back of the mind, it's like, got to get that data. got to make sure I got my job. Got to make sure my org gets that contract next year. And that's the wrong way to approach this crisis. Sean, do you want to help? ask one last question to one person. Sure, this question is for Mayor Durkin. And so Mayor Durkin, the navigation team that was responsible for city outreach and encampments was defunded. And then once the school children started returning to school, it came to light that there was a large encampment at the Broadview Thompson School in North Seattle. And that encampment's still there. And I'm wondering if you think that we could have done more as a city to kind of head that off before it became the crisis that it was with children returning to school with the encampment on school property or, or, or is the city kind of punting like, hey, we've uh, we had to defund the navigation team. So what you see is what you get. I mean, where's the responsibility lie for that? You know, I think, again, it's it's a, a complex issue, but I'll say this on Broadview Thompson so that everyone knows. We've been working with Seattle Public Schools for the last many weeks um, to do significant outreach to all of the people who are in house there to get them services and places to live. And we think we'll be able to complete that hopefully by mid-November. And so I think that was a lot about Seattle Public Schools and the city of Seattle working together because it was their land and they wanted, and they, they had the responsibility for it, but when you've now worked out a collaborative relationship. On the navigation team, I, again, I think that, you know, I think it was a mistake to defund the navigation team. And I think that, again, it was this binary approach that we could only have X type of outreach workers and we had to call them something different and that we should never have police involved. I don't think police function should be to be primarily working with people experiencing homelessness. Um, but at the same time, there is a reality, a public safety reality in some situations. In the recent weeks, I've received letters from all of the city workers who are doing um, encampment and outreach work, asking for police presence because they've had, they've run into difficulties. And last week I met with a lot of the service providers that deal with high acuity people that are concerned that when they have those emergency circumstances and call police, they can't come and do what they need. So I think we have to really focus on what that job is, but we also have to realize we have to lead with a different type of outreach, but there will be some circumstances that implicate public safety. Um, and, and it isn't a binary choice. Can I add one thing to that? Actually, this is really important to me. Like one of the things that, so I, I work you know, as Tiffany, I think, has alluded very closely with a number of outreach teams across the city, particularly in downtown. Um, and one of the things that I have heard directly from outreach staff is that one of the reasons they have often said, like, wait, I think we actually need police here are not because of anyone who's experiencing homelessness. It is because of the people who show up and harass them while they're trying to do their work. And like, that has to stop. <laughs> like, like this is one of those situations of like being so far behind, you think you're first, right? Like there are, these are our outreach staff, many of whom have been frontline staff for years attempting to do their jobs, right? And connect with people. And because, you know, there are folks who think that this is a sweep or whatever, they show up and they start engaging in really violent behavior with the outreach team members. And like, and, and so they have started to say, well, we don't know what to do anymore. And I've had outreach workers say to me, I like, you know, I, I am an abolitionist. Like these are the things I believe. And after what I have just experienced today, I don't know what to do anymore, right? So like, I just, I really need to be clear like with our, our community that like, if we are unable 
to have a conversation at complexity that isn't literally shoving someone, trying to assist someone in gathering their things, then we've lost. We've just lost. Um, and that's not about how much money we spend. That's not about whether or not we are very smart people. That is about whether or not we are able to maintain the fundamentals of social fabric.